The government has tried its hardest to bury this report deep inside military lockers for the last 50 years. Now Gaurav Savant has dug it out, putting it out in the public domain. And yes, there is an argument that this was classified military history shouldn't be put out. But we believe very strongly that in the interest of public debate and learning from history, we need to know what really happened. I'm joined tonight by former Chief of the Indian Army Staff, General VP Malik. Welcome, sir. We're also joined by Air Marshal Padamjeet Singh Aluwalia, former Chief of the Western Southern Command. And my colleague Gaurav Savant is joining us. I want to go across first to General VP Malik on the story that Gaurav has done tonight, sir. You know, people should know about what happened. It's been 50 years. This Thorat paper has been buried. No one. I'm sure you knew about the fact that such a report existed. But military historians, people in the public never knew about it. Now it appears that two years before the war, the military leadership was warned about the imminent possibility of a Chinese attack, yet no action was taken. Who do you hold accountable, sir? I, I hold uh, the then uh, Prime Minister and the Defence Minister uh, totally responsible for uh, the kind of uh, environment that they had created. Incidentally, I heard a lecture given by General Thorat uh, when I was a very young officer. I think it was in 1960, if I recall, in which he had brought out all these aspects that uh, Gaurav has just now mentioned uh, from that report on Lal Killa. Most of us knew about it, that this was a kind of assessment which had been uh, written by General Thorat. But as we all know, General Thorat was superseded and he never became the next chief. Now, that is the kind of, uh, I would say, uh, that, that is the kind of uh, contempt that people had, the politi political leadership at the Prime Minister and the uh, Defence Minister had for the senior army officers who did not, they, who did not agree with their assessment. You know, all along, uh, I must tell you that right from 1950 onwards, when Sadar Patel wrote that letter, I think everybody knows about it today, and he had warned Pandit Nehru about uh, the threat from, uh, potential threat from China. Now, that letter was uh, kept uh, in the uh, lockers for 18 years. And after 18 years, uh, that letter and that uh, assessment came out. Similarly, whatever was said and written about China, uh, people just did not accept it. The political leadership had a mindset which was totally closed to the threat from China. And okay. as a result, that the military leaders, whoever wanted to be heard and whoever wrote an assessment, it was, uh, it was just trashed by these people. General Malik, you're saying that it is the fault of Pandit Nehru and the civilian leadership, but I'm also reading from this report and the official version of the military history of the Indian Army states, Gaurav, uh, that this was never brought to Pandit Nehru's notice. Is that correct, that the civilian leadership was never informed about General Thorat's uh, report by his seniors? Because that's a grave lapse as well. Uh, the then Defence Minister, Krishna Menon, he was a part of this exercise and most most uh, generals and soldiers of that time say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure General Malik and uh, and Air Marshal Alwalia would agree. Mr. It was Mr. Krishna Menon who did not let these papers reach Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. When this exercise Lal Kila was held, there was alarm in the army and in South Block. Why? This was the most detailed assessment ever till date of Chinese military buildup and Chinese infrastructure build up across the MacMahon line. General Thorat studied China's, uh, uh, as Army Commander Eastern Command, studied China's military build up for over a year, 1959 to 1960. Then he put, and it wasn't just military assessment, it was Army, IB, RAW, all intelligence inputs that were coming in, all ground intelligence that was coming in. This was the most detailed exercise done Sadly, Mr. Krishna Menon and Mr. Nehru were not interested because they were more interested in Panchil and Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai. Air Marshal Aluwalia, what I find strange is that it's taken 50 years for a correspondent to dig this out. That's how buried 
uh, this particular report was because it shows the then military and civilian leadership in very poor light. But as a nation that suffered the ignominy of defeat at the hands of the Chinese, India needs to use this opportunity of the 50th anniversary to reflect, which is something we find, apart from what the media is doing, completely missing in the public doctrine uh, through what the government is doing, sir. Well, undoubtedly, you've got to differentiate between the cause and the symptom. These are all symptoms coming up. But the cause, of course, has been the involvement or the lack of involvement or the lack of encouragement of the military leadership being involved in higher defense management. I, I can understand that, you know, even when a chief is selected, he is probably selected in file. At no stage is he even interviewed uh, to, be cap to be capable of being the chief or an assessment made on that. Now, this is something very strange because at the end of the day, unless the military is involved in the entire planning stage, this is what is going to happen. It has happened in the past. It will happen in the future. And therefore, the higher defense management in our country needs to be restructured. This has been said time over and over again, but it has never been done. It is not even in the cards to be being done. And I think this is what we have to take note of. Yeah. In this case, undoubtedly the military leadership at that time was frozen yes. the political leadership was also frozen and therefore we got into the situation uh, between you know october and november of 62 as to what transpired is one of the biggest mysteries you can say uh, for the debacle oh absolutely because one of the biggest mysteries in fact of the 1962 debacle is the reason for not using the indian air force and we saw very recently uh, the current chief of the air force say that if the indian air force had been pressed into service then the history of uh, that war would have been different in fact gaurav uh, let's just take a look at the second part of your report which deals with why uh, the indian air force was not used for offensive operations. They just sat there in the hangars. Recently, uh, the Chief of Air Staff, M.A.K. Brown, claimed that the IAF had, had been used. The results of the war could have been very different. In 1960, Lieutenant General Thorat had wargamed the use of the Indian Air Force not only for transport and logistical roles, but also for offensive operations behind enemy lines. Lieutenant General Thorat went in-depth talking about the use of IAF jets in different theatres during exercise Lal Kila in 1960, you see those images up on your screen, the IF was an integral part of the operation in both the northern and the eastern theatres. The transport aircraft were to be used for quick movement of troops and logistics in different terrain. Airdrops were integral to sustain troops in Sela, Bomdila, Tawang in the east and Chushul in eastern Ladakh. But the general wanted the IF to be used to bomb Chinese concentrations. Page 23 of the report that got of his access is devoted entirely to the offensive role of the IAF in the Eastern Theatre to destroy Chinese army logistics, supply routes and bases. IAF sources say fighter pilots had carried out reconnaissance operations and marked specific areas and maps. However, the order to use the Indian Air Force never came. IAF sources say India may not have been numerically stronger but was technologically far superior to the Chinese Air Force. Air Force was only utilized for air transport uh, operations to support the Army. But this time, I can assure you, there will be no such limitation. And I'm very confident that the Air Force will play a very leading role, not just uh, against that or any other sector, if the need arises. We had frontline fighters. As against that, what did China have? MiG-15s, MiG-17s, IL-28s, all outdated and uh, uh, machines which were no match to our machines at that time. So it was actually, I am very sorry to say that, it was a total moribund, the bureaucracy and uh, more importantly the higher, uh, the higher uh, order of the hierarchy. It's the most absurd situation you've got at that time, top of the line, frontline fighter aircraft lying in the hangars and you don't use them. I want to put that question first to General VP Malik. General Malik, what explains the fact that we've got these Air Force aircraft and we don't bring them out when we are being attacked? You know, uh, that has something to do with their understanding, the political understanding. And uh, Mr. B.N. Malik, who was also 
uh, involved in policy making those days. See, they did not want to escalate the war and they thought that China also will not escalate this situation or this uh, forward uh, policy. Uh, so they didn't want to escalate it and that's why they did not use the Air Force. But I, I totally agree with uh, Air Chief Marshal Brown uh, that if the Air Force had been used, I don't say that we would have then been able to uh, reverse the whatever has happened. But uh, I'm quite certain that uh, the damage would have been much less. Okay, let's get uh, Air Marshal Aluwali to war game this for us. With all the experience at his command, Air Marshal, you know, uh, the current chief says if the Air Force had been used, the results could have been different. You know the sort of technology that was available at the time. How different could the results have been? Would it have been a stalemate? Would we have ensured the Chinese wouldn't have been intruding us? Or would we have beaten them? Well, uh, actually, there are two components to this. Let's first discuss the operational aspects. Uh, it's very clear that uh, at that point in time, the Chinese had just about four airfields, which are uh, actually out of range for any operations in the sectors that had this conflict. Uh, whereas on us, and plus they were at much higher altitudes, which meant that they could carry very limited load, they could carry very limited fuel, and they would not be able to use the entire operational potential of whatever little of the Air Force that they had. And the reverse was the process uh, 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 as far as India is concerned, as far as the Indian Air Force is concerned, because we had Gohati, we had Tezpur, we had Jorat, we had all these airfields, then we had Mistyas, we had, uh, you know, Tofanis, we had Nats, we had Hunters, uh, we had Canberras, uh, which could have done photo, for, uh, photo recce, which actually they did. Uh, so therefore, it was absolutely mandatory, I would say, to have used the Air Force. Because certainly, the progress on the ground of the Chinese forces would have been restricted, if not overturned completely. And therefore, I think it was a drastic error not to have done this. Having said that, what is the solution? Why does this happen again and again? It happened again in Kargil. The use I'm of coming to that. Okay. I'm coming to the level of preparedness, but I want to bring mm -hmm. Gaurav in also on this issue of the Air Force not being used. General Malik also wants to make a point because Gaurav, to people who are watching this broadcast who obviously weren't around 50 years ago, it's inconceivable that you've got the most lethal component of your armory sitting around while you're being attacked, you're being beaten, your people are being killed, and yet we don't use our Air Force. You know, sadly, once the offensive started on the 20th of October in 1962, whether it was the then military leadership or the political leadership, sadly, some of them were running around like headless chicken. Nobody then knew what was happening. They, there was a long time to rally them around. Uh, uh, and, and by then, the Chinese had walked all over you and had walked back within a month. Military leadership... In 1960, General Thorat's papers, and I've read through these papers very categorically, is speaking about the use of air force, is wargaming it, he's talking about the use of air force in different theatres of war, he's also factoring in a, in a, a hostile East Pakistan at that point of time, and saying what element of my army and air force needs to be used for East Pakistan, what needs to be used for China, and how am I supposed to fight it. Mr. Krishna Menon as defense minister is sitting there and he's not listening to him. The prime minister, when, when General Thorat went and met the prime minister after the debacle, says, why wasn't any of this told to me? And General Thorat turns around and says, it's because Mr. Krishna Menon never brought it to your notice. And that insulation of the prime minister from the three service chiefs led to the problem then perhaps will lead to the problems in future. And therefore, General Malik, it is that much more important. The role of people like Krishna Menon and the army chief at that time and others in the senior military leadership who didn't act with valor uh, must be exposed. Reports like the Henderson Brook Committee report you know, needs to be brought out in the public domain so that the entire nation and all historians and current uh, journalists, people out in the public know who was responsible for this ignominy. I agree with you, Rahul. Actually, if you have you have to study the way the armed forces were treated right from the independence onwards. At one stage, our strength of the army was four and a half lakhs, and they wanted it to be reduced to one and a half lakhs, and the remainder three lakhs to be converted into labor corps. And there was much discussion over this uh, between General uh, uh, Srinagesh and the defense minister and the Prime Minister also. So the, there was a total erosion of the strength, of the capabilities 
and also of the kind of leadership and morale that we have when you have favorites and those favorites are being looked after and the people who are capable of delivering the goods they are being shunted out of the army general sd verma uh, resigned general thorot resigned all these capable people were not uh, they were not even heard uh, by the prime minister so what do you expect the result is that coming back to the air force let me also mention you know all these advances in the mountains were taking place on one road one single road one artery both by us as well as by china so that could have been easily uh, intercepted by our bombed, fighters yeah. if they had been used we we should have yeah. bombed that road there's no reason why it wasn't in the last and concluding part of my debate tonight i want to focus uh, general malik first with you on how prepared are we today to ensure that the mistakes of 50 years ago don't get repeated we're seeing the manner in which china is building up in the border areas in arunachal near ladakh also the access with pakistan we'd all nuclear armed powers now do you think we can avert another disaster because there's been a lot of commentary in the strategic affairs circle that china is prepping for another conflict to take attention away from its internal problems yeah firstly i think i must make this point that we should not compare the present situation with that of 1962 that is over that was 50 years ago today the environment is totally different both from the chinese side as well as from our side there is no doubt that they have created an excellent infrastructure uh, the chinese have created an excellent uh, infrastructure in the uh, in tibet and their capabilities have increased or improved many fold uh, on our side unfortunately we have been lagging behind although we keep talking about it again and again but we are lagging behind in creating an infrastructure and unless a proper infrastructure is created uh, along the border Uh, you know no amount of uh, military formations uh, can deliver the goods because there is no maneuver possible in those areas the second thing is the kind of equipment that we need now artillery for example i, I don't know how many years have gone past when we've been talking about medium uh, artillery uh, something uh, replacing the bofors are coming as good as bofors but we have not been able to take such decisions so both from the capabilities point of view as well as from the infrastructure on the ground point of view we are lagging behind now i am not going to, i am not saying that therefore uh, that chinese can come and uh, uh, capture tawang or capture the whole of uh, nepal that is not possible because today we are definitely much better off no. but i think we have to make sure that our bigger disadvantages that i have just now mentioned those uh, those uh, Uh, those problems are resolved but marshal alwalia yeah, if you look at the spirit which the indian air force squadrons are depleting vis-a-vis -vis projections and the requirements you know the fact is now the chinese with all the reverse engineering they're doing the equipment and the technology they're steering from here and there they're actually far better prepared so ironically now the chinese are way ahead of our air force when we had it we didn't use it today we need to use it the chinese are better than us uh, uh rahul actually like i said in the beginning it's very important to understand you know the nuances behind this rather than imagining that the chinese will be a threat the chinese will come we got to understand that we've got to have a national security strategy this national security strategy will boil down to a national military strategy and this will come back doctrines come down to doctrines and come back come down to concept of operations now unless we do all this in peace time where we have a concept of operations and integrated integrated concept of operations between the army the navy and the air force these kind of situations will keep arising we've got to be prepared during peace time for the contingencies that happen during conflict situations and we are unable to do that as of now we must understand that it is not possible and why would china would want to come and have these kind of conflicts why did it happen in 62 okay i think the biggest reason was tibet the biggest reason was the dalai lama coming in the biggest reason was their kind of culture their kind of strategic thinking that they want to make an issue out of okay. something but for them to keep coming in i don't see them having any objectives as such so therefore we got to be a little careful but we can only be careful if we are able to utilize the monies 
which belong to the people of this country, the ordinary citizens, so that our concepts are in place, integrated concepts. And I can assure you that as far as the Air Force is concerned, it is well off. It is not numbers, sir. It is not numbers. And whoever keeps talking about 39 squadrons and 32 squadrons, etc., I, I think they're just talking out of place. Okay. Because, because uh, the aircraft that we have now, each one is capable of carrying four, five, six times uh, more accurate weapons, precision attack weapons, that will be required okay. in the future. Gentlemen, I'm out of time. Those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. But the problem in India is unless you know your history, how are you going to learn from it? And in that regard, Gaurav, for having dug out the classified General Thorat papers, congratulations. This is a very important part of military history. We'll be putting it up on our website. We'll be carrying it in our print publications because people need to know what went wrong. The fact that there was advice available, advice which was ignored, those who were at the helm need to answer. Air Marshal Aluwalia, General VP Malik for joining me for this special discussion. Thank you very much.